On this episode of China Unscripted, the joys of studying Xi Jinping thought, what it's like being followed by a mysterious woman in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong police have lost their minds. Hi, welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Zhang, and I'm Matt Ganesta. And before we get into it, I just want to introduce the tea that we are drinking tonight. Shelley, you just made this very strange face. I was just laughing about how Matt's "I'm Matt Ganesta" was super low this time. I I try to deepen my voice so I sound more authoritative. Okay. Ah. So anyway, I, I just want to be more like Chris Chapel. Hey, we I don't can't do- all have Chris's golden pipes. Hey, speaking of golden. Tonight, we are drinking tea from our sponsors, Path of Cha. The tea tonight is award-winning Yunnan Dianhong Black Tea. And the leaves are golden-tipped. Now, so have a sip, guys. Enjoy. Stop sipping into the microphone, guys. It's uh, They need to know that we're doing this for real. It's like 9 at night and we're drinking tea. This quite, offends Chris's sensibilities. It does. But but the tea is quite nice. Mm, yeah. So this actually won a silver medal at the 2018 Spring Global Tea Championship. So this is award-winning tea. It's a beautiful color, too. Yeah. So this is um, what in China they would call a red tea, but what we would typically in the West call a black tea. I've never heard of red tea. Well, red tea is what we call black tea. But yeah, so the leaves themselves are beautiful. They've got like this... Uh, twisted kind of golden leaf quality to it yeah so again thank you to our sponsors path of cha Uh, i highly recommend getting some of your own we're drinking again tonight the award-winning yunnan dian hong black tea we have a link below so order through that and uh, support the show Um, in case you're listening on itunes where you don't have a description the link is it's www.pathofcha.com slash question mark REF equals China Unscripted. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Enjoy the tea. Joining us today is Kevin Carrico. Kevin, you've done a lot of really important things. You've authored several amazing books about China. You lecture on China studies at Monash University. You were recently on the front lines of protests in Hong Kong. But in my humble opinion, your greatest achievement becoming a certified expert in Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Please, tell us about how you got that certificate. Oh, well, yeah, I I signed up for um, this online edX class uh, offered um, in cooperation with uh, Tsinghua University on, you know, I can't remember perhaps the full title, it was quite long, but yeah, something with... Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for the new era, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I signed up really just as a, a joke. But uh, as I went through the class, I realized that I was uh, paying enough attention that I was really, you know, acing all of the, uh, the multiple choice quizzes uh, that, they were being off- that were being offered. Um, what were some of the questions? Oh, some of the questions? Well, the questions were vacuous enough for me have to to have uh, completely forgotten um <laughs> but uh generally there were questions like how many times did xi jinping say the word or the term the people in his speech to the 17th party congress or so you know something along those lines and this wow. was um you know taken to be evidence of his deep care and concern for the people right oh, naturally. um yeah, so as I uh, proceeded through, I realized I was doing so well that I might as well invest $49 in getting a, an official certificate. Ooh, that's Chinese communism in action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I, uh, you know, eventually I, I passed with flying colors and I got my certificate. I have it hanging on the door of my office. <laughs> um, now, um, after I wrote an article about the class uh, that was one might say, you know, mildly critical. The class was actually canceled uh, very quickly. And also my, um, as a result, my certificate was erased. Oh, no. 
Uh, thankfully, I saved it um, as a PDF so that I can have that uh, as a testament to my uh, achievements in the field. And also all the lessons you learned have been saved in your heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I really regret ruining the fun for everybody when I uh, wrote a little article on foreign policy mocking uh, the entire class. Well, what you've essentially done is guaranteed that you are one of the few experts oh, yeah. in this class. Yes, yes, indeed. And, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, Xinhua should start contacting me um, for uh, commentaries on Xi Jinping thought. I was going to ask if anybody had been in touch since you, you yeah, the foreigner, yeah. had aced this class. Yeah. No, I am. Um, it's funny. When I was in Hong Kong in um, 2017, on the uh, 20th anniversary of the handover, somebody from Xinhua based in Australia actually emailed me and sent me a number of questions, you know, sort of along the lines of, um, oh, how has the Chinese Communist Party helped Hong Kong become a wonderful place since 1997? And, um, you know, how much do you think, uh, you know, the CCP has helped Hong Kong, uh, uh, you know, a million percent or two million percent or something, you know? Um, and I just told them, I said, oh, you know, I... I can't answer these questions dishonestly, and if I if I answer them honestly, you're not going to publish them. And um, they uh, they never got back in touch with me, unfortunately. So. But uh, but speaking of of getting in contact with people connected with the Chinese government, you actually uh, had been under surveillance in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a uh, another very interesting uh, moment in. Uh, Late 2018, I have to say 2018 was quite the year, you know, I get my certificate in Xi Jinping thought, Chinese state media follows me in Hong Kong, it's uh, quite the year, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I visited in uh, December of 2018 for about 10 days. I did uh, one talk with a sort of, um, sort of an NGO uh, interested in political developments, um, and most of the other time I was just researching meeting with friends, etc. Almost, uh, well, let's see, it was basically the second day I was there, I uh, was riding on the MTR, and I noticed a, uh, a lady looking at me at times, and she had a, a sweatshirt that said Oxford University. And, uh, you know, I was sort of perplexed. Um, I don't know. I mean, you guys have seen me. Women don't look at me a lot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was, was it like you know, a do uh, I know her kind of thing? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not, uh, people aren't exactly uh, trying to glance at me a lot, you know. Um, so uh, I was trying to think, I thought, uh, yeah, yeah, do I know her? And then she had an Oxford shirt on. And so I thought, oh, you know, maybe she read my book and she recognized me. I don't know. But that seems very, very far fetched. Um, Anyway, you know, I got off the train, walked around a shopping mall, as we do in Hong Kong. So um, true. And then as I walked, I noticed everywhere I went, this lady was there. And uh, I started to realize, like, wow, this is really either a really odd coincidence or this lady's following me. So uh, I went uh, down to the uh, the bathroom in the basement of this um, mall. And when I came out of the bathroom, uh, this lady, she was right there, uh, you know, in the in the basement. And that's when I realized, oh, OK, this is extremely weird. So as I was taking the uh, escalator back up, I got off the escalator, turned around and tried to take a photo of her as she rode up the escalator behind me. And she uh, literally turned around 180 degrees and, and rode the escalator backwards, which gave me a sense that, OK, this is not <laughs> just a coincidence. I, uh, you know, I don't have any training in, uh, you know, counter espionage um, skills, but uh, something about turning 100 percent, you know, 100 percent backwards clued me in. Um, a regular it, now, bond. it doesn't seem yeah, like yeah. she had a lot of training and counter espionage skills either. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I mean, well, well, that that's, you know, an issue that emerges in this, you know, was this person subtly 
trying to follow me uh, to make me not notice? Or were they just being horribly clumsy in an attempt to make me notice that I was being followed? Now, considering the intellectual level of the average person who works for Chinese state media, I'm guessing it was the former. They were just quite bad at uh, following me. Um, but, you, you know, the, the uh, latter is uh, always possible. Anyway, uh, once I noticed this person following me, basically any time I stopped, they stopped and pretended they were doing something else. And you forgot that they were following you at that point, naturally, right? <laughs> no, no, no. It, eventually... You know, I, I just wanted to go sit down, kind of read a book, relax. Um, but with, you know, this uh, dummy following me, I, I didn't really feel terribly comfortable uh, doing that. So, so I ended up just taking the MTR back to my hotel. And curiously, it seemed that nobody followed me uh, because I did. Uh, you know, it's funny. I. I tried to just figure out like a few things I could do on my own at the moment to see if I was being followed, like, uh, you know, pretending to get on an MTR train and then just kind of hopping off at the last moment right before, um, you know, the train departs and then seeing, you know, if anybody else hopped off with me. Um, now, I, I unfortunately regularly do that kind of thing nowadays in Hong Kong. Um, and unfortunately, there's a growing number of people who have to do that type of thing uh, in Hong Kong uh, on a daily basis. So those people uh, suffer uh, quite a bit more th than I do. Um, but um, I really had no idea who had uh, been following me until I got back to Australia. Um, you know, uh, 10 days later or so, um, and realized that I was on the uh, front cover of uh, Wen Wei Bo, um, which um, is a um, widely distributed but not terribly popular Beijing-owned newspaper in Hong Kong. Um, they get their circulation up by uh, dropping, you know, 20 copies of their horrible paper in uh, basically every uh, apartment block in Hong Kong. And uh, people then use those newspapers to, uh, you know, collect their dog feces and things like that. Um, so um, that's Wen Wei Bo, that's what they do. Um, and um, I think um, the fuss that I made about them following me, um, certainly serve to, um, how shall I say it, make them divert their attention from me. Uh, they haven't bothered me since, um, but uh, I'm certainly not under the illusion uh, that uh, I travel to Hong Kong free from any surveillance. Um, the uh, paper is, of course, owned by the Beijing Liaison Office, um, so this was effectively you know, Beijing spying on me in Hong Kong. Um, and I don't think, uh, I think everything that we see in Hong Kong today shows that Beijing doesn't really learn any lessons uh, from its mistakes. Um, so I'm sure that they, uh, you know, uh, continue to uh, follow me from time to time, just probably in more subtle ways that um, I don't notice. Or perhaps uh, they've realized that uh, they do have better things to do than just follow a, um, you know, a clumsy guy who meets a few people and then goes to either Five Guys or Shake Shack for dinner. Um, you know, if, uh, wait, 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 there's Shake Shack in Hong Kong? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, actually how, two shit. How did packs. we not know about this, guys? Oh, my God. We spent all our time going to McDonald's. <laughs> all right. We're, oh. we're, we're going back to Hong Kong, guys. For the Shake yeah, Shack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, there's, there's no, no Shake Shack. There's no Shake Shack or Five Guys in uh, Australia. Um, oh. So, yeah, one of the benefits of me doing research in Hong Kong um, is not only that I can discover interesting things, you know, uh, write good articles. It's also that I can, um, you know, visit Shake Shack and Five Guys uh, regularly. 
So yeah, and that's that's important. Well, you would you would just uh, when you were under surveillance, that was December 2018. But you had just gotten back recently from Hong Kong, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was there in June. I was also there in August. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm traveling there quite regularly. Yeah. Uh, so tell us what you're re- what you're researching on related to Hong Kong. I'm working on the emergence of tensions between um, the People's Republic of China and Hong Kong over the past, uh, you know, 22 years since Hong Kong's uh, integration into China. Well, are um, there any tensions now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, as I always say, I'm uh, a little busy uh, right now. Um <laughs> But uh, I'm particularly focused on, um, how shall I say it, the emergence of the uh, Hong Kong nationalist movement or the Hong Kong uh, independence movement um, as a uh, sort of product uh, of those tensions. Um, So, yeah, yeah, right now is obviously um, a fascinating, busy time. Um, And I... um, Yeah, yeah. I had the um, pleasure uh, of being in Hong Kong on uh, June 12th, um, the day that um, this current wave of protests, you know, really kicked off. Um, So you got tear gassed? Yes, yes, yes. I, um, you know, I I actually landed in Hong Kong um, early in the morning of June 12th. I went uh, directly to uh, Admiralty, um, where the uh, Legislative Council is, and I I was, you know, quite surprised to see literally thousands of people there uh, already. Um, By uh, 8 a.m., you know, the main stretch of road uh, in front of the uh, Legislative Council, uh, of course, I forget the street name, uh, uh, had been, uh, you know, occupied um, by uh, protesters. Uh, I watched as that unfolded. Um, And, um, you know, I I was uh, quite excited to see, really, after years and years of pressure building up since 2014, um, with the uh, central government and the local government, both you know, becoming increasingly interventionist in um, Hong Kong politics and society. It was exciting to see people finally, you know, coming out and really, you know, making their voices heard, um, expressing that their deep dissatisfaction with not only this, you know, horrible extradition legislation, but also just with the general direction in which Hong Kong was moving um, all of these years. Um, So uh, that morning was a moment of, um, you know, how shall I say it, you know, hesitant optimism, right? To finally see this large turnout and this kind of burst of activism in response to this uh, legislation. Now, the afternoon was a completely uh, different story. Um, by about uh, three o'clock, you know, the police began to essentially lose their minds, um, firing tear gas like it was just, you know, I don't know what they were firing tear gas like it was. Like it was, it was just going a, out of fashion. Like, Ro- yeah, like yeah. Roman candles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was almost as if their tear gas was about to expire, and if they didn't use it that day, uh, I was going to be yeah, Maybe overdue. that's what happened. Uh, They're cleaning out yeah. their tear gas fridge, you know? I mean, yeah. we, we do know that yeah, they, yeah. there was some expired tear gas, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. That, that was my attempt to sort of reference that, right? Um, because, yeah, yeah, there's been firing of a lot uh, of expired tear gas. Um, Wait, and, so is, is um, expired tear gas better or worse than regular tear gas yeah yeah it's uh neither is uh, great you know i wouldn't recommend either as a as somebody who is now a connoisseur 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like something I order on the side with dinner. I mean, um, do you have a favorite vintage? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, I've, uh, of course, I'm not a scientist, uh, but, but I've read that, you know, the reason tear gas has an expiration date is because the um, contents in it can degrade and become potentially poisonous um, with, uh, you know, potential cyanide development. Um, but, um, mm. of course, someone listening could say that I'm wrong. I'm not a, I'm not a tear gas scientist. I'm not even a, a scientist. I'm just, uh, you know. You're a guy with a certificate in Xi Jinping thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've just choked on some tear gas, you know, the last two months. Um, but, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, they that afternoon, uh, the police lost their minds, um, and I, you know, I first went to Hong Kong, um, you know, like seventeen years ago. Um, I remember, you know, thinking of the police as, like, how shall I say it? I, I mean, police that I could trust, people that I could talk to if I had a problem. You sound you know? so skeptical saying this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were so this young was, and naive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was coming from China at the time, you know, <laughs> and police, uh, how should I say it? I mean, I never felt like while I was in China, like, oh, you know, if I encounter a problem, I can go talk to this policeman and he'll be really cool and helpful. Um, but that was indeed how I felt, um, in Hong Kong. Um, and so I was shocked to see the way the police acted, um, June 12th, I mean, indiscriminately firing tear gas, you know, indiscriminately firing rubber bullets, um, chasing people with batons, um, you know, uh, chasing me, um, uh, and I had to uh, jump over a, a barricade that uh, protesters had constructed um, to get away from the police. And, you know, that was the most exercise I've ever had uh, <laughs> in, the, in the last decade. I mean, you guys have seen me. You, you don't want to see me running down the street, huffing and puffing in, uh, you know, 100 degree heat, um, especially with a, you know, policeman chasing me with a baton. It's a, it's not a pretty sight. Um, so uh, eventually the police uh, chased us into the various office buildings surrounding Admiralty, um, office buildings and malls, um, People got closed in in Pacific Place. I got closed in in, I think it was Lippo Plaza, which is an office building. Um, and we were just, you know, police stood at the door and just blocked us from leaving, which was, I think, perhaps a fire hazard, um, but also completely insane because at this point it was 5 o'clock, 5.30. You know, everybody who works in Lippo Plaza was getting off work and they're coming down. Uh, there's a bunch of people in gas masks <laughs> in the uh, office building lobby and police blocking everybody from leaving. So of course, you know, they're a bit shocked and confused. Um, and eventually, you know, um, I gradually made my way uh, out a back door um, toward central um, thinking that the protests had been uh, cleared, um, when all of a sudden I noticed that the main thoroughfare in Central uh, was, you know, still occupied. Um, so um, I think that was kind of a, a testament um, to, um, you know, the strength of these protesters. You know, I got chased away. We all got cleared out. Um, but there were still people there, you know, 8 p.m., 9 p.m., all the way until late into the night. Um, and still, you know, more than two months later, uh, more than 80 days later, longer than the uh, uh, movement of uh, 2014, um, there's still, uh, you know, people coming out in full force 
And obviously, this is no longer just about uh, an extradition bill. I think it is, you know, fundamentally about a completely non-transparent, completely unaccountable Hong Kong government that uh, doesn't serve the interests of the Hong Kong people. Its sole purpose is to serve the interests uh, of Beijing. Um, And that's not a government that the thoughtful and engaged people of Hong Kong deserve. Have you seen a difference in the because you were just there recently and you were there in june have you seen a difference in in the protests in august versus june i think yeah well when i was there in june i think everybody was kind of still surprised kind of that this had become quite as big as it did right i um you know i was also there in april Um, And the first protest against, uh, you know, the extradition bill, you had maybe 5,000 people come out. You know, it it was pathetic. Um, So in June, when this all kicked off, I think there was kind of a widespread element of surprise, like, wow, this is, you know. It's happening. Actually, yeah, yeah, this is actually going down. Um, Now... You know, what I would have expected in August, I would have thought there would be some kind of fatigue at some point. You know, I I can't imagine going out and being chased by the police and choking on tear gas, you know, certainly every weekend, if not almost every weekday night um, for two months. Um, But I think people seemed, you know, just as energized, if not even more energized. Um, One thing I did notice um, was how sincerely hated the police and the uh, local government are right now. Um, Of course, the local government as, you know, essentially a colonial extension of the uh, central government. Um, I, um, in the sort of surprise of June 12th, you know, there was the surprise that all those people came out. There was the surprise that, you know, the roads were occupied for the first time since 2014. But there was also surprise, of course, that the police behaved the way they did. Um, By August, you know, there's no more naivete or surprise about the police behavior. Um, There's almost a certain glee, right, in messing with the police, you know, pointing lasers at them. Um, And the police have almost come to be seen as, how shall I say it, you know, um, just the main representatives of, you know, what's come to be seen as almost an occupying force. You know, those are (laughs) big dramatic words. Um, But um, yeah, that's essentially um, how I felt people saw them. Um, So as a result, I don't see any easy path out um, for these protests. Um, You know, uh, people, I think, are even more determined and even more angry uh, than they were in June, uh, precisely because the longer that this conflict goes on, the more anger and animosity builds up um, due to the government and the police's mishandling of uh, these protests. When you say the people uh, are upset with the police, you know what, we've seen, I think three times uh, since June, more than a million people coming out to protest. But a lot of these smaller protests, the ones that that get tear gassed are like, you know, several thousand or, or, you know, something in that neighborhood, right? And and so is, is the public anger at the police broad, like, you know, the quarter of the city that comes out to protest in those, you know, those big 
movements or is it more that it's it's sort of concentrated within the smaller number of more active younger protesters Mm. Uh, that is a good question i mean i think that the particular anger that i'm talking about could be you know sort of um uh, could be attributed to kind of the smaller uh, group of, um, you know, protesters who are, you know, pointing lasers at, at police and things like that, or uh, gathering inside police stations and yelling. Um, at the same time, however, I do think that disappointment and concern about the police is a uh, considerably more widespread. Um, now I, you know, talk to a, uh, fairly select group of people, of course, who, um, are by no means representative of sort of, you know, the middle ground in Hong Kong politics. Um, but I think that whether we're talking about, you know, media or, um, you know, sort of casual uh, conversations on the streets um people are i think greatly disappointed and concerned about the way the hong kong police have responded um to this series of protests um with really quite excessive and unnecessary force um so there's, I think, an important distinction, right, between being disappointed in the police um, and joining further, you know, peaceful protests um, versus, you know, people who are really angry at the police and um, engage in the type of behavior that we saw, you know, last Saturday with um, people chasing after police, kicking police fighting back against police. Occasional um, Maltov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what I would say is that that kind of behavior was really, I think, unthinkable on June 12th, right? I, I watched as police approached and people ran away, you know? Um, so now that we've reached a point where people are angry enough about the police where they just say, whatever, I'm not going to run away from the police. I'm going to, you know, stand here and fight with them. Um, I think that's not a reflection of a problem with the protesters so much as it's a reflection of a problem with the way the police have handled this. Um, and essentially cultivated um i would almost say you know a considerable uh, percentage of a particular generation of people who essentially think of the police as you know as i said you know an occupying force uh, trying to deny them uh, basic rights and freedoms that have actually been guaranteed under the basic law, um, but that are now at, at substantial risk uh, of being denied. It's uh, almost like the police are creating their own antagonists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, starting from June 12th, um, you know, I heard people saying, oh, you know, there's Chinese police from Guangdong who have come over, you know, to Hong Kong. Um and I'm, you know, I'm certainly not naive or overly optimistic. I think that that could be, you know, a possibility, right? But I think another possibility is just that people in Hong Kong didn't ever envision that their police could behave like this, right? And so there's this need to kind of externalize it, to, to think of, oh, well, these must be, you know, Chinese cops who have come over. Um, in reality, if you uh, look at, you know, the Hong Kong police force, uh, you know, they've gone and received crowd, con crowd control training um, in Xinjiang. Um, so as with all matters 
it's increasingly difficult when we're talking about governmental matters to draw any type of distinction between, you know, the Chinese authorities and the uh, Hong Kong authorities. Um, but, um, you know, people still hope for and wish for that difference, uh, even as it disappears increasingly rapidly. So when you say Hong Kong police seem to have lost their minds, do you think it is a result of more influence from Beijing, whether it's crowd control in Xinjiang, which has very peaceful streets, by the way? And, <laughs> or like, why did they lose their mind? That's something people have been asking. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I can acknowledge their jobs are not easy. I mean, you know, if I had to stand outside doing crowd control this entire summer in Hong Kong, I'd probably be a little grumpy too. Um, but Fair the point. problem is that the problem is that you know everybody's jobs are difficult. Everybody's jobs make people grumpy, right? You know, just because I'm having a difficult class where people, you know, aren't contributing to the discussion or didn't do the reading. You I can't just fire say tear like, gas at your students. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't just say like, oh, do the reading next time or I'm going to bring tear gas to class, you know. Um, a similar logic, it, you know, uh, applies to the Hong Kong police. Um, but the problem is that essentially they've been given, you know, essentially endorsement to really do whatever they want without any accountability. Um, and as a, as a friend who I met uh, um, during my last visit to Hong Kong uh, commented to me, um, he said, oh, you know, if I could do whatever I wanted uh, without uh, any accountability, you know, I'd be a, a horrible piece of shit as well, you know? Um, <laughs> but... Uh, that's really, you know, the reality that we're facing. Um, you know, police are admittedly under great pressure, um, but they've also been given sort of a uh, get out of jail free card um, such that they no longer need to maintain seemingly any type of discipline. Um, and they feel, you know, entitled to just, uh, you know, fire tear gas, chase people, hit people. Um, an example that I um, would share from my uh, recent visit to Hong Kong, this was at this point about 12 days ago, um, the weekend in which no tear gas was fired. I think it was the 11th week of protests. It's sad that that's now the exception to the rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and and this was, you know, a major, you know, topic in media coverage, hey, no tear gas was fired this weekend, okay? But a uh, cop shot, you know, a beanbag round, uh, you know, less than 20 meters from me. Um, and that was not at all a, a reasonable, you know, uh, option uh, at that moment but, but the cop did that you know people were shocked for a moment and then there was almost no reporting on it instead it was oh well, the weekend without tear gas right um, so how shall I say it yeah the, the Hong Kong police have yeah they feel entitled to do whatever they want to do there's a reason that they feel that way because the Hong Kong government has said, you know, Carrie Lam has openly said uh, that she's not going to endorse an independent commission looking into police brutality. Um, so there's simply no accountability. Um, and there is thus really no way out of these building tensions between the people and the police, which is also, you know, the police are representative, of course, of the Hong Kong government and, of course, the central government, of which both are really just an extension. 
we were there the night july 1st when the protesters broke into legco Mm -hmm. and it seemed like the government was waiting for this moment when the people of hong kong more broadly would turn against the protesters Mm -hmm. but that doesn't seem to have happened would you say that's (laughs) that's that's like you know you were there recently like does it seem like people still broadly support the protesters yeah, yeah. I mean, again, you know, I'm uh, talking to, uh, you know, a very specific group of people. Um, but uh, looking at, you know, uh, even just the turnout last night, Hong Kong time, um, in Central, uh, for a protest against um, essentially uh, sexual violence, um enacted by the police against uh, female protesters in strip searches and other um, quite uh, disturbing uh, developments, you you know, you had a really substantial uh, turnout there. Um, And I think what we're seeing is, sure, people may be, to a degree, tired out by all the protests, Sure, people may wish that uh, things could just go back to normal. Um, But I think that people are not placing the blame for things being abnormal on the protesters, but rather, you know, placing that blame uh, squarely at the feet of the Hong Kong and central governments um, and realizing that in their refusal to yield the refusal to give, you know, even an inch, it seems, other than saying that the bill is um, dead, but not officially withdrawn, of course, which is contradictory. Um, There's, um, I think, real substantial and uh, understandable uh, disappointment at the government um, as really the primary driver of these protests, uh, not so much protesters themselves. Um, and I think that's important to recognize. And just as long as that remains the way people tend to view these protests, I think they'll enjoy widespread support. It seems like the Hong Kong government strategy is if you want to change people's hearts, crack down even harder. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is, this is, you know, I I don't want to compare what's happening in Hong Kong to what happened in Beijing in 1989. Um, But I want to say that the way that they're responding is a not Tiananmen model, but post Tiananmen model. Insofar as, you know, after the violence in Tiananmen Square, um, there was, and of course, you know, far beyond, you know, Mu Sidi, Chengdu, et cetera, um, you know, there was an attempt to essentially use a combination of economic opportunism and political taboos, right, to get people to sign kind of a social contract wherein so far as one stays away from politics, you know, everybody can make money and supposedly uh, be happy, right? Um, That's the uh, post Tiananmen model in China. Um, And I feel like there has been an attempt to Uh, sort of enact that in Hong Kong in in recent years, um, you know, trying to focus on quote unquote livelihood issues while steering away from giving any ground on major political issues that are the source of people's main discontent. Um, And the only problem, of course, with this model is that it can work when you have absolute control over media, absolute control over educational institutions. 
and essentially absolute control over, you know, uh, almost all of society as the CCP does uh, in China. But when you're dealing with a complex society uh, with an open media, open internet, you know, opinion leaders who are generally um, not afraid to share their real opinions, um, this kind of, uh, you know, focus on let's just get busy with economics and uh, stay away from political issues, uh, it simply doesn't work because people naturally have interests in and investment in uh, political matters and, you know, want to be involved. Um, so the, I think the problem that emerges here is that Beijing really doesn't know how to deal with a complicated, you know, diverse society over which it doesn't exercise absolute control. Um, and uh, we see, you know, as a result, the exercise of power, uh, you know, very much uh, unraveling. Um, and um, really the only way that they know how to respond is crack down, crack down, crack down, plus a few economic incentives. And, um, you know, uh, I often make predictions that are often wrong, uh, but I will say, you know, without a political solution uh, to uh, the current events in Hong Kong, there's really, you know, no path out. Well, it seems like another part of the problem is also the Hong Kong police now are very incentivized to make sure there is no independent investigation into police brutality, because I don't think that would go very well for them. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, clearly they have behaved in a completely undisciplined, non-professional manner. If they had, they wouldn't be opposed to an independent investigation, right? There doesn't seem to be a way forward there. Um, and, you know, we see kind of the emergence of, you know, uh, almost a police state, right? Um, insofar as the police in Hong Kong can now act essentially without having to pay any price uh, for their own misbehavior. Um, that teaches the police uh, the wrong lesson. Um, and obviously it's uh, not terribly popular with the general public. Well, I think that's also dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party because if they don't hold that kind of control over Hong Kong police and they start acting more independently, that could put the Communist Party in a politically awkward situation. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I've been, I think, quite shocked and disappointed with the degree to which, you know, Hong Kong police not only, you know, obey orders, but almost go beyond orders. Um, and I think, um, you know, there has been sort of growing anger at and dehumanization of protesters. Um, and what, uh, and when that's, you know, combined with, you know, complete unaccountability, you know, what really concerns me is the possibility that one of these days, you know, the police are going to get really out of control even more than they already have, you know, and, uh, you know, shoot somebody or something like that. Um, and, um, I think when that happens, you know, things will spiral even further out of control than they already are. Um, and, um, you know, there's really, once that happens, you know, really no going back from that. Do you think there's any chance this could spread to mainland China? Well, I think that would be very interesting and exciting. Um, there is, of course, you know, a massive propaganda effort 
to discredit the Hong Kong protests. I haven't been to China recently, so I don't know how widespread that is believed, but I'm sure that, you know, a considerable number of people believe it. Um, for those who don't believe it, of course, the issue that emerges is even if they do take action, try to go out onto the streets, um, the central government is, you know, far less restrained in responding to protests uh, in China uh, than it is uh, in Hong Kong. Um, so, how shall I say it? I mean, you know, while that would be interesting to see, um, I would be afraid that uh, it would just result in, you know, uh, more violence uh, from the state um, unless people found you know, an effective way to push back against that violence, which um, is, uh, you know, possible perhaps, but difficult to predict. Well, in an attempt to try and end this on a slightly more lighthearted note, which was worse, studying Xi Jinping thought or being quarantined for SARS? <laughs> uh, I would say... Uh, I wish I could have gotten them done all at once, you know, like uh, be quarantined. And while I was there, uh, just uh, study some Xi Jinping thought. But uh, that would unfortunately, you know, require a uh, quite an odd time machine. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, actually, I, I think um, both were important learning experiences. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, I went to China in the early 2000s. I think, um, of course, very open-minded, but also to a degree very naive about the nature of the Chinese state. Um, and a series of events uh, in my life um, helped, I think, to help me to kind of see um, kind of the reality of uh, the current uh, Chinese government uh, without any quote unquote, uh, how shall I say it, colored glasses, right? Uh, to, to borrow, I guess. Uh, uh, a common uh, term. Um, the rose-colored glasses, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think uh, being quarantined during SARS was just kind of a first step uh, in thinking about these matters. Um, I remember watching uh, CCTV at the time. Um, and, you know, I... Quite a few people were quarantined uh, at the time. I, I was quarantined simply for being foreign, which was quite amusing. The worst um, disease of all. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I watched, you know, CCTV news at the time, and uh, there were all these reports about, hey, you know, when you think about it, being quarantined is fun. People bring <laughs> in. You can just kick back, relax at home. People oh, bring you food, you know. Um, now, the ironic thing was nobody brought me food. I, I don't know if it was because they didn't know what I ate. You know, they were like, oh, I don't know. What does he want? Uh, a hamburger? Oh, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, or if the uh, news reporting about bringing food was simply, you know, not true. Um, and they didn't have five guys or Shake Shack in yeah. Beijing at the time. No, no, unfortunately not. Um, so, so I had to resolve uh, that, uh, you know, on my own. Um, and uh, one thing that I did get delivered uh, every day um, 
was uh, two guys who, uh, you know, they they looked like uh, they came out of that scene in the movie E.T., right, where uh, the people come in the the full body, you know, kind of suits. Whoa. Like the hazmat uh, suits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would roll up at my apartment, you know, I'm sure my neighbors who uh, I think reported me to the authorities um, would love this. Um, yeah, yeah, they show up in hazmat suits and take my temperature. And, um, you know, of course, I didn't have a temperature because I hadn't gone anywhere. And, oh, you know, Nanjing at the time didn't have SARS, right, everybody? Wink, wink. Um, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, they, these people would show up every day at different times of the day. Yeah. Take my temperature. Um, you know, eventually the quarantine, uh, you know, was lifted. Um, but um, I do have to say, you know, I, I learned a lot uh, in those few days. Um, and um, I think uh, my studies of Xi Jinping thought were... Uh, kind of a, a continuation in that vein um, of uh, being endlessly disappointed in the current state of politics in the People's Republic of China. Xi Jinping thought is just a quarantine for your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, I think we're out of time today, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I, there's a bunch of things I wanted to ask you about the situation in Australia, particularly with the issues of mainland Chinese students and Hong Kong students kind of facing off there. But mm, so yeah. we'll have to get you on another time, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, hey, anytime. Awesome. For now, uh, if anybody listening wanted to learn more about you or what you do, where should they go? Do you have a Twitter handle or someplace you like to direct people? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm on Twitter uh, at Kevin Carrico. That's K-E-V-I-N-C-A-R-R-I-C-O. Um, and yeah, yeah, feel free to pick up a copy of my book, The Great Han. Yeah, so I look forward to having you on another time. Yeah, for sure. I look forward to it as well. Cool. And thank you for listening. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And be sure to check out Path of Cha for some delicious, delicious tea. Link is below. Use that link to order and you'll help support the show. The link verbally is www.pathofcha.com slash question mark REF equals China Unscripted. Buy some tea, support the show. Talk to you later. Mm-hmm.